Um, You're like, where? What am I saying? Yes. Okay. <laughs> where are my notes? Future Skills I Academy. Am, I am Oregon. Yes, I am. Creative Oregon. Leaders Unplugged. Future Skills Academy. Okay. <laughs> Welcome to another episode of Creative Leaders Unplugged. I'm Morgan here with Arna. Yeah, for a podcast brought to you by Future Skills Academy. Today we're talking to Miriam Hadness, a a facilitator. A creator. Yes, clearly. Yes. An, an accidental facilitator. She does a few things ac- accidentally. Yeah. yeah. As, as, as most of us do, really, uh, you kind of just somehow you get into a situation and then after a while you look around and you go like, huh, wait a minute. <laughs> yeah. Well, how did I end up here? I remember being in high school and like, you know, thinking like, what do I do with my life? Right. Who am I going to become as all like uh, high schoolers do? And uh, I, my dad's a very, my dad's an expert in a very niche, very, very, very niche thing. So like in the, in the country, if people know that they need a specialist in this, he's one of the names that comes up. What is the niche? The niche niche. is the, the niche is arc flash hazards in manufacturing environments. So if, uh, if you have so a manufacturing a manufacturing space, you yeah. of course need to protect your employees and people from different mm-hmm. types of hazards. And there's so many different types of hazards. Mm-hmm. And he's he obviously like, and he would go into factories and make sure that they're safe and mm-hmm. provide an, an engineering plan for the companies to make them safer. Right. But he ha- somehow along the way, he became a specialist in arc flashes as where electricity will jump from the machine to the human. Which is not good. You don't want to be. A... No, that, that happens. <laughs> Sorry, it happens. Like... <laughs> it shouldn't, but it does. Mm. And so he became a specialist in this. And I was like, but dad, how did you know that you wanted to be an arc flash a specialist? It sounds like and a superhero. Goes... <laughs> I'm arc flash, arc flash. <laughs> <laughs> you know? This sounds like a job for arc flash. <laughs> <laughs> I never thought of it that way. There he comes. Ooh, the yeah. guy you never want to see. Oh. <laughs> yeah, the guy you never want to see. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. And he, and he was, but that was his response. It's like, I never, I never wanted to. I just had a job and I started learning. And next thing I knew, I kind of knew a little bit more than other people. And people right. started asking me questions. And then I was an expert. Yeah, exactly. It and sounds just, like the Green Lantern. I don't know if you know your super, superheroes. I do know my superheroes. Yeah. Okay. Yes. It's, yes. It's Green Lantern or Arc Flash. Arc Flash. <laughs> I think there's a strong case there. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Sorry. That Accidental was... superhero. But anyways, but just that accidentally things happen. And, you know, one day you're just, okay, let me yeah. do my job. And the next day you're an expert in yeah. Arc Flash. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But, but yeah, exactly. Because... That means that you also recognize that. You go like, oh, because you can just not see that, that that is happening, you know, that you are being asked True. for that. And then you will kind of flow, you know, you it's like being, you know, in the flow, you you know, you, you, you and then recognizing that, say, hey, wait a minute, I, I'm actually an expert in this niche or this specific thing. Like facilitation is a niche, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, mm-hmm. that's a, most people, I think most people are not facilitators. I would agree with that. Yeah. Most people don't know what facilitation is. Right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Most people are not yeah. facilitators. And and so it's it's such a it is a niche, but it's it's interesting how you kind of find yourself that that you are a facilitator or you're even interested in a topic or you kind of like, oh that's a distinct topic and it comes with language. All of a sudden mm-hmm. you talk about oh it has a name. It's not moderator, it's facilitator. What is that? It's that's really, really interesting. And your research, obviously, yeah, is is it might, is it focused specifically on facilitation because it's also about change, All right? Yeah, so. it's well, it's, yeah. We're I mean we're fo- but it's focused specifically on facilitation, but then within a specific context of multi stakeholders. Right. So. Yeah. But you're facilitating sort of change, as a facilitator, you facilitate a systemic change or behavioral change. Mm-hmm. With multi multi stakeholder uh, environment, and then, yeah, yeah. So I mean, that's that's also really interesting because I think a lot of the work facilitators do are within that kind of realm. There are always, you know, there's always a multi stakeholder environment that's always mm-hmm. there, and yeah. and you're asked to. Be, but sometimes you just don't realize that because you are asked to do a workshop, for instance, 
right? And you facilitate a workshop and you don't realize that actually you're in this system. And what you're asked to do is actually changing the system a little bit because you're going to ask people to go from A to B and you're going to guide mm -hmm. them through this creative process. But in the end, something else comes out. It changed. Something changed. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And, and that changes the system somehow. And, and so I think that's such an interesting perspective as a leader that you as a mm -hmm. facilitator, you're not just facilitating a workshop. You are doing something around change. You're a change manager, if you will. Mm -hmm. which is a yes. Really bad word, but that's basically what you're doing. But you, but most facilitators know nothing about change management. They're sort of the traditional kind of body of knowledge of change True. management. They have no clue about that. It's even a, a dirty word. It's even a bad thing. Like you know, manager change management. That's traditional, mm -hmm. old-fashioned in a way. But basically, that's what you're doing. So I, I, I kind of so change managers. Could, should be facilitators and facilitators should be change managers maybe. yeah ideally if you're Perfect. yeah and it's and it's <laughs> i think it's different too like if you're just popping in to host a one-off workshop on okay building personas you can facilitate that but is ideally you don't just walk away with a piece of paper you walk away with something that changes things in the future yeah as well sure yeah so miriam really sparked a lot of things in my head yes. in your head right we were like definitely oh, definitely we had a long conversation yeah so yeah i couldn't yeah, believe I, how how long we talked <laughs> yeah. just about facilitation yeah no a little bit just. about communism but uh and communism <laughs> exactly yes exactly but um, uh yeah and i think but i think being open and and we talk about yeah ai and in the future and but i think a lot of it is you know, just being open, like you said, being open to serendipity and, you know, what is, what does facilitation entail? Yeah. So. All right. Yes. Enjoy. This is very smart to re hit record early so that you don't realize when it's, so that nobody gets in their podcast voice. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> is this why you're doing this? My... No. Yeah. Because we noticed that, that if we go like, and now I'm going to start recording, everybody goes like, but Okay. Yes. Yeah. yes, we're recording now. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> but and actually, sometimes I had actually the conversation we had before I actually press record was so much nicer than the one we had after we press record. Anyway, and, so. Yeah. And then after you stop recording, then the real juicy bits happen. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yes. So yeah, and which is something we're going to talk about because you also have a podcast. Yes, and yes. yes, the workshops work podcast. Yes. All right. Yes. Yes. Yes, because I'm really interested in, and because I've learned that if you want to promote your podcasts, <laughs> you have to be on other people's podcasts, and then they invite you to your podcast, and then you talk about the podcast of this other person, and then your audience will kind of listen to it. So that's sort of, so it's all sales we're doing here, folks. Yes. <laughs> no. <laughs> News to Miriam. She just found out. Oh, maybe we're just passing our our no, audience along. Yeah, 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 yeah. Exactly. Don't steal my audience. If you yes. like this podcast, you might you, also. You might like, yes, exactly. Yeah. I think so. By yeah. the way. I think so. And I think our podcasts are very complementary. And what I love about your podcast is, yeah, that it really focuses on the human side and the stories behind and mm -hmm. that you totally lean, lean into that with curiosity to get to know the humans. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, there's exactly. Been, there's been some podcasts that afterwards Arna and I will reflect and we'll be like, oh, that was brilliant. Such a great conversation. We're like, oh, we didn't even talk about their crowning the uh, professional achievement. And yeah. the, I really they, like that, actually. Didn't they just write a book? <laughs> like, oh, <laughs> Which is very funny because so I don't do any research about my guests because I'm like, I want to be guided by my curiosity. So and whatever they bring up, then I dig deeper. And it had happened to me that after I stopped recording and was about to publish the episode, doing a little bit of research, I realized that they were famous for this one thing that we didn't <laughs> talk a word about. I didn't even ask a question. I didn't know. Oh, mm -hmm. he's the king but then of on Norway. The others, huh? <laughs> he's the king of Norway. Oh, ooh, I didn't, didn't, oh we didn't mention that. <laughs> Honestly, he was probably relieved. Yeah, yeah, exactly. exactly. Yeah, but, so, but in the back of his head, he will go like, he's not asking me about my kind of my royal kind my of kingdom. tasks and the things, my kingdom. You haven't you mentioned. You were so casual. You were so casual. What's going on? 
Oh, you're gonna on the, on the other hand, I then realized so after coming down my kind of oh, imposter, uh-huh. I'm a, such a bad podcaster. I realized yeah. that whenever I am curious about a person and then I stalk them on all the different podcasts, I quickly get annoyed because they continuously always talk about the same story yes, and do. all the hosts ask the same questions about this one thing they are famous for. Yeah. And they were like, oh, cool. And then they come to my podcast to hear all the other stuff that nobody has known about. Them. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. No, no, that's also, I like that. Yeah. So we had Jean Litka on, so the, the previous one I published. And so, but she's, she's so, I mean, she's been on so many podcasts and so many, you know, whatever YouTube videos and interviews and what have you. And so she will kind of, she has these stories ready. Basically, she tells them at conferences, she tells them at podcasts, et cetera. So pocket, those guests are always, stories. The, yeah, stories. which are, they are interested, <laughs> they are interesting and they are, yeah. they're good that she really thought about it and she really means them and they're, they're part of their vision and what she stands for, and what she believes in. So you can't really not use them, but they're, but, but, but are, yeah, I, I do also try then and also. You know, Morgan, you you know, we we will kind of try to go like, yeah, okay, 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 but but, <laughs> it's like, let's you know, to try to kind of, yeah, let's yeah. go, with, like, you know, but why? <laughs> so, yeah, you know, <laughs> and and that that's something I, yeah, we try to do, but I also really enjoy a sort of more, so we're not really focused on anything, so we don't really have a specific. I mean, we have a theme of of creative leadership, mm-hmm. and I believe creative leadership is something new that we, you know, I mean, well, no. We're exploring it. I mean, I have an opinion about it, but we're also exploring mm-hmm. it. We're kind of looking at, are there patterns between the people we kind of talk to? And so, and the patterns, you know, they're there, which are really interesting. But so mm-hmm. we do need to kind of have some kind of a free flow of conversation without really steering it, you know, because yeah, it is a bit of, what, yeah, it's what yeah. Otherwise you're biased exactly. and then you're steering it and then you have a self-fulfilling prophecy. Do you do yeah. research with, do you use the transcript for your research? Yeah, a little bit. Yeah, we haven't still, I mean, we still, we're like, you know, actually we haven't done anything yet. No, we're just yes, having fun. Yes, we do. <laughs> yeah, no, of no, we. ChatGPT <laughs> is just <laughs> writing the thesis. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. We just, get it. yeah, one just weird down. We say, hey, ChatGPT, can you just write the book, please? And it goes, I'm blah. And then it's like, hey, we have a book. Life is so much, I have dyslexia. So if I would have had ChatGPT, when mm. I was a teenager, God, because <laughs> I, yeah. you know, try to get away with every. I mean, I was like, that would be so amazing. I don't know what would have happened. I think I would have stayed very dumb because <laughs> I would, like, I wouldn't do, I would not have done anything anymore ever, but I would have been really good in manipulating and using AI. That yes. would be my thing. And two thoughts come from, to my mind. My first thought was, yes. We're using ChatGPT mostly for the wrong reasons. And then second thought is there's so many people who have social dyslexia. I don't know whether this is a com- concept. Mm, what's what's that, this? Like, that they they cannot use appropriate language to address people in a way that the other received the message well. Mm. And ChatGPT is such a good tool also to bridge that. Yeah. So, so social I mean, dyslexia, I, I totally made that up in the moment. So I don't know whether this is going to I want to have it. I was, disclaimer. I was like, this, disclaimer. This, might, this might fit. But also I've used ChatGPT <laughs> obviously to write so many emails. But then going back to Ms. Lidka's uh, pocket stories, I, I have my own pocket stories because I know that it works. I know that I've crafted the message to land with people. And oh, okay, I, I pull out the story of how I moved to the Netherlands. Okay, pull out pull, pull that out of my pocket. And so it's it's funny that you say it because it does feel like uh, yeah. yeah, and I think you can. Oh, I'm loving that. It's like having two parallel conversations at the same time. So the yeah. the where are the you pocket, now? The pocket story. What I I think it is an art to deliver the pocket stories in a way as if they are new and novel and still intriguing, mm-hmm. because. I must say that if I'm, sometimes I have this, I pull out my pocket story and I'm so bored by my own words that I just want to fall asleep or push the <laughs> fast forward button. And then there's some, you hear them say it for the tens or hundreds time and it's still intriguing. Yeah. Like I like the word. I, 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 sorry, go ahead. I was just going to say like a comedian who's polishing their jokes and you could hear the same yes. joke, but each time it's getting better. Yes. Well, yes. it is true. I mean, in a way that that is sort of the art of, 
communication really if you want to so i i used to work for a design agency and i was always the one going to clients to basically do pitches and 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 and, and share sort of you know whatever we came up with and then try to sell it to the client and by you know repeating you know that often and doing that often and especially practicing sort of that pitch you know you you know you you're going to use less words it's going to be so and also if you so for people who want to are looking for a new job for instance you know i always say go go and it doesn't matter if you get the job you know but you have to have those interviews have the interviews right because yeah. you're going to learn you're going to listen to i mean if you would would record them the first interview you've ever done and the last one you've ever done if you did like a 20 or or i don't know 100 of them it's different it's 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 better if you're going to improve you're going to leave out a lot of stuff so it's it's that iteration and that learning of just do 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 yeah and then there's another use case of chatgpt right there to to record your whatever you want to deliver and let it be summarized by AI because I find it fascinating what it picks up sometimes as most important things apparently. And I think to get this mirror of what is a neutral machine algorithm picking up as a most important thing. So apparently it's something that you have emphasized a lot or words you have used a lot, or maybe it's even intonation if you're using a voice, voice summary tool. And I'm I'm curious actually whether there is something to take away and to learn from it. Because sometimes when I use I always use nowadays a tool to to get the show notes and a summary of the podcast. Mm -hmm. And I still pay a copywriter to write the show notes and the and I do the summaries myself. But it helps me just to to get this transcript and to have another point of view. And sometimes I'm just shocked by like, why is all the summary about the kind of 15 minutes blurb at the beginning to warm up and this mm -hmm. one topic we spend some time, but leaving out all the juicy stuff. Yeah. 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 It's interesting. Yeah. And it's we've, not, I mean, we've so, had the same experience. Yeah. Yeah. And it's not perfect. So it's, you know, and which is, but it, but that's the danger of it because it, 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 if you read it, it almost sounds perfect. And you can kind of, yeah. and we experimented with sort of having sort of the transcript and then saying, okay, just write a short article based on this mm -hmm. transcript. And you get an article that reads really well and, it, and it's very, you know, nicely written and it's great. It and and say it changed the tone of voice. Yeah. And then you go back, was that actually what we talked about? <laughs> and then exactly. Like, actually, that's not really the essence of what we talked about i think and it's there's doubt in my head as well as like is it was it i don't know anymore i have to re-listen to get to it again shoot i would never have written that but so there is a there's a sort of there's something about it as sort of an experimentation tool there's something about it as an ideation tool it's something that mm -hmm. is it kind of kind of kind of uh, you know gives you something to think about you go like huh really but it's but having it as a sort of finished product, it take you know you need to be critical. The critical mm -hmm. thinking skills, I think, yes, are going to becoming more and more important. And and so we are in this stage where we don't have those critical thinking skills yet. Mm -hmm. So the majority of stuff right now, I think I I I think I read it somewhere like that is posted right now on social media and like on Medium and on LinkedIn and all these articles are like just this like this nonsense AI stuff that doesn't really say anything but it sounds nice because we we're kind of which is I you know, we can be really critical but it's also that's how we kind of play around with it and try it out and and then later because that's what I do I go all in I go like yeah this is amazing I'm just wrong. and then a couple of weeks later I go like that was terrible. Nah. That was horrible. Like, <laughs> I'm oh disappointed. My God. Yeah. So, what is and, that? And all about? still, I think, just as Morgan said, using it for, for example, for writing emails. So, mm -hmm. the my idea of the social dyslexia came from an experience where I received an email from a client and you might relate to the feeling that you get this email and you get so angry and you just want to put your anger somewhere and you want to write this passive aggressive reply <laughs> but you're I've not never experienced to. anything like this ever i have <laughs> so, so, so right what i, dear what I did was, write me an angry email 
uh, I actually did the opposite. So I did write this passive aggressive, very angry email. Mm. And instead of hitting re reply, I put it into ChatGPT and said, please rephrase so that it sounds clear and professional, but brings across the point that I want to make. Yes. And then it rephrased it. And then I gave a few other pointers to point out that the client was coming from Asia. So I didn't want them to lose face. So it made it even more precise. And this email, I sent it without changing anything to this client and received a reply. Miriam, thank you so much for the constructive feedback. We totally agree. Let's jump on a call and let's do as you suggested. I'm like, oh, wow. <laughs> and I still felt this deep satisfaction of having yeah. screamed out my anger into an email. And yeah. I think what we, what I learned from from this experimentation with AI and ChatGPT is that when we really know what to say, mm -hmm. it's amazing because it helps us these last five or ten percent of polishing it and making putting the the sentences together and getting the punctuation and the yeah everything right that's just annoying but when i tell it exactly what i want to say it creates this beautiful email if i don't know what to say chatgpt won't tell me no exactly and that's the yeah. point right so yeah. what do you want what is the what, what do you want to you know what's your vision what, what's your story what's your point what's your what do you want to you know you know what do you want people to kind of read and experience and feel or whatever if mm -hmm. you don't know that my only criticism would be that so for instance you know you uh, i see things that were created by ai and it is in a way sometimes you have to be careful with if it doesn't cost so it takes away the sort of the, the burden or the 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 the, the, the mundane or the, the, the sort of that work that you don't want to do if sometimes the value is in the work so yes. right yes. so for instance i've seen posts about hey you can create a persona just using chat gpd you go like you know and i'm thinking the point of making a persona is building empathy yes you have to go talk to people you Excellent you point. it's a human to human kind of experience that you then maybe you can use you know ai chat gpd whatever to kind of create a nice story maybe but you do have to do yes. the work yes and uh, it was also i think it was a something which I saw online about you know, music and making songs and uh, writing music. And that's actually the, 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 the pain of the artist in trying mm. to get this, getting, that's the value of the piece of art. It's not the end result, which is the most interesting part. It's yeah. actually, it's, it's the, the, the path. So there's and the a, imperfection. Uh, I'm, and I'm the thinking imperfection. of a love letter. So yeah, exactly. we're receiving exactly. a love letter. So yeah. all the, all the little things can Dear be Chet in GPT, there. Write me a love letter to my wife. Exactly. I, and no, you can no. put in everything that that stands out for this person that you want to mention. And then it's too polished. It's too perfect that it won't land. Whereas, and I think the the last five or 10% are also then in the imperfection of this humanness. Because at the end of the day, it's not the perfection that we value, but it's the effort and the human the exactly. care. Yeah, the you care, wrote it. The extra 5%. Yeah. And, yes. and I think if you now, and if hearing you say this, I'm thinking that the effort is going to be more, the value of effort is going up. So mm. the, the market value of effort is going to rise because you can, it can be so easy now to write whatever. If you write by hand, you know, so in your yeah. own words, that's going to be more valuable now. Because you don't have to, it's, you can just have it, you know, you have this machine that can do it for you. And the love yes. letter, you know, written by you with your mistake that you actually did it, you actually, you know, like, just like the drawing you made with your hand, because it's about the human and the story and, and the effort and AI will never have that. And yeah, I, I yeah. think that's an interesting change. And I, yeah. I love, I love the fact that, that AI is going to, you're going to mess us everything up a little bit it goes like, ah. yes you know i love that because yeah I think as, as creatives it's where we go like ah that's interesting you know what's that chaos yay <laughs> yeah and i think it's going to also put an interesting change between art and you know either content or design because all three things are very different right and art is coming from a very personal like expressive i want to 
you know, share this feeling or emotion or express a point of view, where sending an email, of course, needs creativity to write, but it is not necessarily art, not always. Well, personally. I've certainly, re- my inbox is not art right now. I can tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, mean, I wish it was. Yet, I wish my yet. inbox was art. Listen, in a, in a thousand think... years time, they're going to f- dig up your inbox somewhere in the future, <laughs> somewhere. And they go like, whoa, look at what people did. Look at that. Is that what they... Fascinating. Fascinating. They communicated like that. Let's put it into a museum. <laughs> yes. Morgan's emails. Emails. And, uh, oh, that yeah. would be wild. Yeah. Yeah, it's going to happen. Uh, yes, you know, so because... art is, and I love that because art, as you said, is in we're doing art for ourselves to express something personal. Mm-hmm. Uh, an email is outward focus, so it's, it's to address yeah, usually to accomplish a means. Let me share this yeah. message with you. And, and design as well is, is for, design is, is to solve a problem. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, exactly. that's outside, not inside. Yeah, well, correct. and then you could say, well, because I know designers who have a very specific style. It's very personal, their mm. style. So they're asked for their kind of, you know, style of, of designing. And a lot of designers operate in the overlap. Yeah. And they have to, but if it's not useful, yeah. if not, if it's not user centric, it's not design. So or it's, yeah. So it's we'll out. get the, we're getting into a yeah. sort of a, a sort of two spaces where if it's, if it doesn't have to be personal, so mm-hmm. you know you can see sort of the sort of the the hand of the master, if you will. You know, it's not a personal mm-hmm. thing. It's not someone like the love love letter it needs to be very personal. So there's a kind mm-hmm. of a scale, something that really needs to be really personal. You can't leave that to anything else. Yeah. Or it, it doesn't really have to. That email just has to be correct. And you just want the people from a different culture. You don't want to insult them, but you don't really know what the words, you know, the subtleties of it. And it can help you. It doesn't matter if it's your style. It's yeah. just you want to you want to have a get a message across, right? And so the same with design. I think that that sometimes it's functional, and the more functional it is, I don't need to see the personal style of the graphic designer who does the traffic signs or something. You know, who care? You know, really, <laughs> I want that to work, and I want an AI can be really be better because yeah. it might be smarter in saying no, actually. You know, if I compare all the data in the world around traffic and 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 signage, this is the better signage. Fine, that's okay. Who cares, right? But then there's this personal, like you might you know, of a specific brand, for instance, that needs a specific feeling, and it works with this famous designer, and they, and and that designer he or she may always creates these kind of types of designs because that's sort of part of the personality yeah. of that designer, what whatever. So I think there's an interesting scale that is kind of that's always been there by the way obviously it's the same true for leadership where leadership there is always a personal there must be a t- personal touch to leadership because at the end of the day the leader is in service of others but it's through, also through their per- personality and charisma and then there's very functional leadership like in the army or in the nasa and then there's very creative inspirational leadership yeah that's interesting yeah should, is there like a difference between, would that then be management and leadership? Mm. Mm. Don't but, tell those leaders that. <laughs> because I think even, even a leader in the army, and then I learned, I learned from a podcast recently that, yeah, a leader in the, and even from my podcast, leader in the Navy SEALs or Air Force is very different from a leader with the troops kind of. A, okay. Sure. So, yeah. and still I think... You wouldn't call them a micromanager because they cannot be there and tell everyone exactly what Ooh, to do. So yeah. even a functional leader has to be a leader in the sense that they inspire others to do the work instead of doing it themselves. Yeah, but that's something that mm-hmm. that's that sort of has been kind of a shift in leadership, right? So yeah. we we can, you know also in armies, if you will, you know, and I have no clue about armies, what's up, but what I do know about books from the books I read is that the, also there, you need soldiers who think for themselves and teams that are sort of mm-hmm. agile teams, basically. It's yeah. an agile organization. Whereas micromanagers, and that was sort of the criticism right now of the Russian army, for instance, they're full of micromanagers. And that's why, you know, so many people get killed because actually they're not really, they're not, in, they don't think independently. Of that's why communism hasn't worked. Okay, yeah. that's that's a tangent. 
<laughs> well, yeah, yeah, exactly. So, yeah, exactly. So, so that idea of that you need independent thinkers and people who kind of take their own responsibility and their ownership, you know, and yeah, I, I guess that's the, and I'm, I'm, I'm kind of hesitating to go into the sort of the <laughs> communism thing, because I say that, is it really, what is communism really the way we think about it? The Russian is, for instance, never really has it's been a communist than country. Attention. Yeah, and China has never been a communist country because that's that was not that's not communism, yes. right? It's actually that's actually I think the you know the, the epiphany of communism is everybody owns and has ownership and responsibility for everything, which is really difficult to imagine. But it has nothing to do with having a dictator. That's not communism. Yeah. Anyway, that's having a. <laughs> I agree. That's a conversation for a different podcast, maybe. If you host a podcast, if in the audience someone is hosting a podcast. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Talking about political system and communism. Please invite us. Yeah, yeah, please. We would love to. I have ideas. I have. Yeah. I'm really regretting sleeping through all of my high school history classes right now. Uh, so, yeah, well, you know, you know, get invited to the right podcasts and you can learn. No, but the thing is that it's about leadership. There is sort yeah. of it is leadership. So you have dictators and you you have micromanagers and you have you know you have leaders who are creative leaders and sort of the way I I would sort of you know, I think you can learn from all of them, uh, you know, the right things, wrong things, and, and and some leaders get stuff done that other leaders can't get done. I mean, if you are an, a sort of, a, sort of like a dictator type of manager, leader, I mean, you can get stuff done that other people, other managers or leaders can't get done, maybe, you could argue, right? Whether, but the point is that if you want everyone to kind of be happy and fulfilled, and uh, if you want to be... So, because I can't imagine having a company where, and this is like, these are true numbers, like 80% of the people in your company are unhappy, mm. you know, it's like, what's going on? That's crazy. Right. Yeah. But we have loads of those, uh, so those companies. And yeah. why do you accept that as a leader? And I think that because we came from this industrial, uh, this is my pocket story, by the way, the industrial, <laughs> industrial revolution. This <laughs> clever. Yeah, disclaimer. No, but we came from the industrial revolution, but we always think that time passes by and a hundred years is so long ago. And, you know, 200 years ago, it's like, that's never even happened, but it's not true. Certain things you remain with us for so long. Mm -hmm. And, and so we are still stuck in that system, but we don't want to be. So having sort of these new ways of organizing and the need for new leaders and leaders who are not managers or micromanagers, if you will, but leaders who can create a space for people so they can have control and they can have ownership. Mm -hmm. I call them, you know, either creative leaders or facilitative leaderships because facilitation is that that's the leadership quality that we're looking for. And yes, we're getting to you stole my you know, you're going, Go, go. How dare you? <laughs> say it again. Say it again. No, go, you go. <laughs> Thank you. I'm so happy we agree. And I'm not surprised. <laughs> I did my research. No, no, this is really my, it was my pocket story, but I knew it was going to connect to you. Yeah, I was, um, as you spoke, I was thinking several things. One was that I would while I would still consider a dictator a leader, I would not consider a micromanager a leader. Because a dictator, they are still leading with a strong vision, mm -hmm. might not agree with this vision, <laughs> and they inspire others to do the work for them. Mm -hmm. We might not agree with the work they inspire them to do, but they do it. Whereas a micromanager is telling everyone exactly what to do and is not leading with a vision. And they often keep doing it oh, themselves too. Like, uh, you exactly. know, yeah. they end up doing it themselves. And I think a micromanager is inspired by a lack of inspired. What is it? Oh, inspired. It's, it's limited. Ah, uh, yeah. What is the uh, opposite of inspiration? Desperation. Desperate. It's desperate. <laughs> desperate for uh is is lacking self-confidence actually for sure yeah and therefore needs this hold on to control and make so there is this insecurity and driven by fear instead of driven by inspiration and yeah. and then i wonder whether 
the creative or the leadership that is, I think, in our world's aspiration is then the facilitative leadership, because a a dictator would not facilitate their leadership because facilitation mm -hmm. then inspires others to to own, yeah. to have a share in the power, whereas a creative leader, a facilitative leader is taking space to share space. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I was just trying to think how I would define it. And I was like, it's someone who gets in the way or, you know, stands up on stage mm -hmm. to then get out of the way. Yeah. It's, and and then at the end, if it's very successful facilitation, everyone is like, look at what we just did. Look at what we just yeah. accomplished. But yeah. then when it's like, oh, well, okay, how did you experience the facilitation? Okay. Yeah. Well, we accomplished this, but we couldn't have done it without their contribution. Yeah. Yeah. And still it needs a leader to lead with, with a vision because as beautiful as the idea is that, okay, we all own it and total flat hierarchies. I think maybe I'm surrounded too much with facilitators, which is like, <laughs> just like herding cats. <laughs> At the end, you do need someone who says, okay, and this is how we're going to do it now. Oh, yeah, sure, yeah. sure. Yeah. Or who, who leads with a strong vision. Yeah, for sure. Or shared goal, yeah. Yeah, but that doesn't necessarily have to be sort of hierarchy. I mean, that's a role. That's yeah. a that's a function you have. Mm, you're really thank good you. At, you yes. are really good at that. Yes. Yeah. Interesting. I think this I, is I, also very cultural. The Dutch Dutch hierarchy is very, very flat compared to many countries. So this yes. type of approach, as flat as it is in the Netherlands, wouldn't work in the United States. It's like, mm. you know, at the end of, you know, we all come together and sure we can, we can share things together and, and work together as a team. But at the end of the day, if the guy who's above you on the payroll, you know, if she, if she makes that call, that's what it's going to be, you know? Yeah. So yeah, there's no argument. And yeah. Interesting. Does a dictator breed micromanagers? Does a dictator create mm. Micromanagers, mm. because you because you're afraid because it's I driven by fear. Yeah. So, yeah. so yeah. a creative or a facilitative leader will kind of then create more facilitative leaders. Yeah, because it's not Which, driven by fear. Yeah. Which reminds me of the concept that if you hire A, a people, they will hire other A people. If you hire B people, exactly. they will hire C people. Yeah, you hire the people that are better than you are. Exactly. And you, and you have nice. to not fear the competition, but see the quality and aspire, yeah. aspire quality. So if that's, you hire yes. great people, they will hire even better people. If you yes. hire mediocre people, they will hire worse people because they are fearing the competition don't yeah. want to be pointed yeah. out. But this is a, this is a big, again, this is about leadership again, because I've experienced firsthand and many times over at um, the agencies that founders of agencies, leaders of agencies would hire people who are not as good as they are because mm. they, it would, because they didn't want to be challenged in their minds. They didn't even realize that, by the way, they just felt more comfortable with people who weren't that good as they are. Yeah. And the better people they found annoying. Yeah. And, you know, right? so, <laughs> and I've, I've seen that happen. You go like, Oh, so I now, saw this in academia happen. Same. Very yeah. dangerous. Yeah. It's dangerous. Yeah. And it's, it's really interesting how, that's a typical thing people do, but that also means that you are, so again, you're afraid there's fear and, and that is such a, and, or, or maybe it's trust. Maybe it's not fear, but it's also trust. So you don't, you really mm -hmm. trust others and you don't, don't even trust yourself. Trust yourself. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so there's a trust gap. And I think, I think trust is another thing. And, and as a facilitative leader, you first of all have to trust in your own ability, which is really difficult Trust that you can be vulnerable. The trust that you don't have to be perfect, right? Trust that you can yeah. go, like, I don't know. And that and that because trusting that the others will kind of, that it will resonate because they don't know either. So yeah. you have to trust that we all are equal. Clueless. And that if you share that, others will go, ah, yeah, uh, yeah. that's nice because that gives me the space also not to know and not to be perfect, et cetera, et cetera. But, that, that, but having, being able to be that, that, that vulnerable that is a lot. You need to trust, and and that always obviously takes practice as well. You have to kind of all, all of a sudden go like, oh wait a minute, <laughs> me trying to be perfect and the expert, and that's the problem. But yeah. letting go, and and I think so. It's it's fear, but it's connected to trust. I think a lack of trust in yourself. 
And I would even connect it to psychological safety. Sure. Mm -hmm. It's a term maybe a bit overused, but I think very rarely, often misused or not understood. So this concept of psychological safety, of having a space where we can be vulnerable and vulnerable being to say that I don't know, being vulnerable to ask a question, to admit, being vulnerable to share an idea. And not agree, be vulnerable, yes. be open to say, I don't agree, or yeah. I, I I have a completely different thought, or uh, I don't mm-hmm. like, I don't feel okay. I don't like this, you know, I, I, I you know, et cetera, right? So, because, you know, that's what I often have. Like, we, we love doing workshops, for instance, that everybody has fun, it's great, it's yay, and then nothing happens because it, the yeah. conversation wasn't real. Yeah. You know, nobody said, you know, something, <laughs> you know. We're never going to do anything with this because I know that after this workshop, you know, yeah. and, you know, we we're, nothing happens. Anyway. Nothing happens because of whatever, right? So that conversation yeah. needs to be had as well. And so the psychological safe space is also to have conflict, uh, because yes. mm-hmm. you know, otherwise nothing happens. Yeah, and what you what you said about the trust in yourself or feeling safe yourself means that you feel safe enough so to stand in that conflict. And I once heard, I think it was Steve and Sarah in my podcast who said that they have observed that facilitators who who have a weird relationship with conflict, so they fear conflict, they tend to have workshops where no conflict occurs. Like, yeah. oh, my, I never have conflict in my workshop. Everything goes down like planned. And I, yeah, because unconsciously, yeah, they avoid yeah. that. They don't go there, yeah. and I think leaders who don't trust themselves or who don't feel confident, don't feel safe, they cannot create the safety for others. Because if I'm, if I fear that someone will point out that I don't know, if I am insecure, I I suffer from severe imposter syndrome. I don't want anyone to ask me a question, because mm-hmm. then they will find out. So yeah, whenever exactly. someone asks a question, I would go, you should know that. I <laughs> yeah, won't yeah. answer that. Yeah. Yeah. And as a facilitator, you will kind of try to avoid tension. And so even if you notice that there is some, you know, some disagreement or there's someone who is really not participating, you know, that makes you nervous and you kind of want to not pay attention to that or kind of want to get away with that. You want to go like, oh, I got away with this. You know, there was no fight. But actually, it was the fight that's the most important thing that needed yeah. to be had. That's why they hired you in the first place. Ex- yeah, but you don't know that because yes. they didn't tell you because they didn't, because the people who hired you, <laughs> they didn't want to talk about that either. So yeah. so, so that's why I always say you know, the success of any workshop, whatever that, that means, uh, is the preparation that you actually know the conflict that's happening with them before you have the workshop. You have to talk to people, you know, yeah. have to talk to them. You're like, you know, because, uh, you know, one of the, <laughs> I had I have so many failures. Oh my God. <laughs> anyway, but the biggest failures were sometimes I, 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 you know, I'm not sure if I can blame myself, but sometimes it's just because I didn't know that something was happening. And I, you know, I remember going, in, walking into a room with a co-facilitator and and it was a room full of people and they were I I heard them talk and we walked in and they went silent. And there was this tension. And and nothing, whatever we did, it, it just fell flat and it wasn't it just didn't work. We were so unhappy. And I, you know, and at, at that time in my career, I was like, it's my fault, it's my fault. I did something wrong, they hate me. You know, I knew it. And uh, so and then and then later they said, Oh, yeah, but just before you walked into the room, there were two departments and they had this big fight. And then you came in and we and they said, uh, we'll leave it for later, for after the workshop. All right, let's just do the workshop first and we'll talk. You know, so and then we came in. And that's so classic. Let's do a game. And (laughs) and we're like, no. And we're like, what's going on? Wow, this and this says so much about the culture of the organization of the team, the misconception of workshops. Yeah, but Mm -hmm. I didn't say, so this is what I've learned. So later in my career, I learned to say, hey, hang on, what's going on? I yeah. feel bad energy. Do yeah. am I the only one? Is it me? And then people go like, "Oh, thank God you you mentioned it because yeah. we all have it." Oh no, this is happening, right? And sure, yeah. as facilitators, you get into 
I got in a situation where, where we did a workshop. It was a big group of people, a big company. And just before I wanted to start with a nice little warm up, uh, the, there was one of the, I don't know how senior it was, but you, you, this most senior person in the room, he said, I have, a, have an announcement. Can I just have the, the group for, for a minute? And he said, oh, by the way, you know, we're having some financial problems with the company. So a lot of the contracts won't kind of, you know, we, you know, we, we won't extend them. And, oh, uh, and so, yeah, yeah, exactly. I was like, okay, here's, well, let's do that game. No, let's not do the game. So I couldn't, I, I, you know, there was no way I, I didn't know. They didn't tell me. I, I talked to these people. I, I asked them how you're doing. Often it's also about, you know, expectations or people expect something different. I did all that. You know, I knew what they expected and, and, mm -hmm. and all the, 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 the miscommunication that happened. But then that bomb was dropped. I wanted to give you an example of the miscommunication yeah, exactly. that happened. <laughs> Boom. Here and is you know, a like, case study. Hello. And I, you know, I, I actually flew, I, I think it was somewhere in the US and I, I flew there just for the workshop. It was like, I'm like, this is, a, how is it possible? Well, what do you like? Cause I haven't, thank God, haven't been in that situation yet. But like, do you give them a break to let them clear their mind? Or you say, you just like, like drag them out of their misery and say, charge yeah, forward. So, the, so first of all, there's a lot of in your head goes, you know, a lot of stuff happens in your head because you mm -hmm. have your plan and it was an amazing plan and it was going to work. And it was, and you mm -hmm. felt excited about this. You're like, yeah, of this course. Thing. but you're also, there's tension because you never know is really going to work. Cause you're just, mm -hmm. I always have plan A and plan B plan. Yeah. Plan A is, is there's always what some I, level what I of shared. improv. Yeah. Yeah. Plan B is what actually going to happen. So we know that it, it's never the, what you thought, but I was ready for all that. And then that happens. And then you go like, I still want to, because I had an agreement with the client that the outcome was going to be this or that, and they needed that outcome for the next stage and mm -hmm. stuff like that. So can I, what do I do? Do I have enough confidence in mm -hmm. myself? And also, you know, it's also about how do I, what, what do I think if I was one of the participants, what mm -hmm. would I actually want to happen now? So, but it's, it takes so much. It's actually really stressful, painful where you go like, when I, so I basically said, okay, okay, stop. We're not going to do the workshop. This is not going to work. It's not going to work. No way. This is not going to work. So we had yeah. two days. I said today, maybe tomorrow, but at least this morning, we're going to talk. We're going to do some, something else. We're going to put you into groups. You're going to talk about this. We're going to share, you know, something. And, and let's find out what we're going to do these two days. We know what, where we wanted to go. That's, you know, you want, because it's not my workshop, it's their mm -hmm. workshop, yes. right? So it's not me. It's not my outcome. I don't own it. They own it. So I basically agree with them. Like, okay, we all know why we're here. We're not going to get there now. Let's spend the morning. Let's see what, what's going to happen. You know, let's talk about this. And then we make another plan. Is that okay? And they went, oh yeah, are you sure. And they, because they were like, I don't care. Actually, they were like, yeah, whatever. Yeah, because this is like horrible. My contract's what this done. guy just yeah. said, you know, what's going to happen because we're going to lose people. And so the, the mood was really down. Anyway, mm -hmm. but do you, are you willing to say, stop, you know, let's not do it? And that's for me where the leadership as a facilitator comes in, because I think many facilitators forget about the leadership role they play. Mm -hmm. And in this situation, also to decide, whom would I, so whom do I serve? And I would be curious what went through your mind. Are you serving in this moment? Are you serving your hiring client who dropped the message or are you serving the group? Yeah, that's the tension, right? Because you go mm -hmm. like, oh, but I was hired. I get paid for, for this. Yeah. So how do I, how do I steer the ship that they will get there somehow because, and at the same time, it's impossible to get there now anyway. So, mm -hmm. and but what about the people in this group? Yeah. I mean, they're going to have a really, they're not going to give me what I want anyway. They're, no energy, mm -hmm. nothing, right? They're not going to give, give themselves fully to what I was planning to do. And I had those sessions, by the way, where people went like, because I don't know, I don't, that's another story, but. Where people went like, oh, okay, all right, fine. You know, let's do, what, what do you want to, what's next? <laughs> what's next? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And because, you know, because they felt there was some tension in the company and et cetera. But are you willing, you know, are you willing to at least talk about that? So what do you feel as a facilitator? Are you willing to say, I feel this, you know, I feel this. 
okay and you know you know what do you feel instead of going like oh i feel this and oh what to do and keep it all internal by just mm -hmm. being a reporter and saying hey i feel this and i see this i see this is happening I observe mm -hmm. this is happening you just got this message i see you go like well ah, this is terrible it's horrible news you know and i feel really awkward about this i don't think we're going to get it to the end that's my problem you know so can i but a lot of facilitators feel that they somehow can't share what they feel. And I wonder whether this comes from a misconception of the neutrality of a facilitator. Oh, I have to be neutral. I have to guide them through the process. Yeah, but isn't and that being I neutral? Think, exactly. Being and neutral? I think the neutrality is regarding the outcome. Yeah. And in order to get them through the process, it's about pointing out these things and being the channel and saying, okay, this is what I hear. This is what I feel. This is what I see. This is what I think you exactly. could yeah. and should do or discuss instead. Yeah. And I think this is why we're hired and where many facilitators don't take the opportunity to step into their leadership when being in the space and hired by a client because they think, oh, I need to be neutral or they don't dare or they're waiting for permission. But yeah. I think the moment we are hired to guide such a process, we are given permission because otherwise there's no point we are there anyway. Yeah, yeah. but that's thinking, the same with the, sorry, go ahead, Morgan. I was going to say, I'm thinking of also, I mean, most of my, I do a, I do a decent amount of facilitation, but most of it happens then in the university. So it's with a, you know, a general specific range, age range of young students who are learning, you know, a new, a new field. And I had the ability to facilitate both business students, but then also the design students and the way, and I tend to be a bit more open and transparent, like, Hey, like stepping in and saying, Hey, I'm sensing this tension right now, or, Hey, you guys told me you'd be at this point in the project but you're not, what do you think is a great idea? But it was very interesting how the business students responded to this versus the design students, because the design students, if you give it to them more openly and honest, they're like, okay, well, this is where we're at. Let's re readjust. And okay, we'll make some adjustments. But the business students lost faith in me. <laughs> and it was like, no, you're the leader. You're the teacher. You have to tell us exactly what we're going to do and we're how we're exactly going mm -hmm. to get there. And it was, so that was also like a moment for me, like, okay, well, just also carry over then when you're facilitating. I mean, because most of the facilitation that happens within business contexts, but when you start thinking of multi-stakeholders, you know, you start working with, you know, homeowners or store employees or, you know, people who aren't necessarily coming from the suits mm -hmm. category. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But we all, yeah. we all were programmed at school in a certain way. So we expect the person in front of the classroom, if you will, the facilitator to tell us what to do. And then when you start facilitating and you don't, you give the ownership because it's not about, mm -hmm. and you know, the worst thing that can happen is that you as a facilitator start owning the content and, and the outcome and, uh, and they don't That's take any responsibility. That's how a lot of classes, that's how yeah. a lot of classes operate. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. But then they Good don't take any. Oh, my God. <laughs> <management. laughs> yeah. And yeah, some students some, like that. <laughs> yeah, some students, yeah, they, they like it. A good dictator. Just tell me what to do, you know. They don't, don't because they don't I take know you like that. Yes. <laughs> hey, but I, I, Miriam, I have a question. Uh, so when, I mean, because for me, facilitation and, and being a facilitator, I, it just kind of just happened. I didn't, you know. I mean, it's been a while, but when I started to call myself a facilitator or talk about facilitation, I mean, you know, that's, a, you know, for me, it was all new. I didn't even know when, when, once I started doing it, I didn't even know I was doing it kind of, I, I started realizing, I, I remember telling a colleague, like, I think I'm facilitating or something, you know, I wasn't even sure if I wanted to do that. I was like, I was, I came from design. I was, I came from getting a brief. Then having mm. my design team come up with something beautiful and gorgeous and amazing, and then selling it to the client that it's amazing, the best thing you could ever have, you know, and then, and that's it. And not facilitating with the, which I absolutely love. And I think it's the best thing that's happened to me, but I, I just, I didn't really, I mean, I didn't, there was no school or something. I wasn't taught to be a facilitator. I just started doing it. So how did you get into that and why, when, you know, did you start calling yourself a facilitator or interested in that theme or when that had happened? What happened? <laughs> what happened? What happened? I, 
in in German there's a phrase that translates something along the lines of I got to facilitation like the Virgin Mary got to a child. <laughs> <laughs> Unintended, unexpected. Holy, holy inspiration. <laughs> it's holy, it's, oh, it's holy inspiration. <laughs> I think I I think I did for so I have a background. So I come from academia. I'm a recovering academic. And <laughs> I think I started facilitating when when I was in the classroom with I was uh, teaching economics to Vietnamese students, talking about socialism, communism. And was faced with the challenge that when I asked them the question, where do you think does the price come from? All the hands went up. The government. I'm like, good, we got some work to do. <laughs> when two months later, we started the Economics 101 class, I prepared the class, the course, according to the textbook. And then found out that in the meantime, they all have read the textbook. Oh, so yes. mm -hmm. I was standing there kind of in 20s and I knew these students know more about economics than I do, at least from what is written in the textbook. So I had to rethink the entire approach to delivering mm -hmm. that class and then started to run classroom experiments, to do case studies, to work with comic books, because oh. I wanted to facilitate the knowledge or facilitate the access to the knowledge, to the economic theory by making it applicable to them. I didn't know the word facilitation back then. So, but I think that's how maybe it started. And then I was working in, I left academia and the teaching and uh, went into higher education strategy and oh. was very fortunate to be hired by uni president as a strategic advisor. And he had the vision to build the new model research university of the 21st century. And he imagined this with a bottom-up strategy process, including professors and students, secretaries, ministers and lobbyists, everyone coming together to rethink what a research university of the 21st century could be. Beautiful project. I was kind of leading it. Still didn't know what facilitation was. I was working with a coach and an excellent facilitator back then. Long story short, the minister changed. <laughs> then my boss went into burnout. Oh, no. uh, my strategy and planning office uh, was dissolved and replaced by McKinsey. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Hooray. Hooray. So I had a little bit too much information and, ex and insights on what happens to an organization if first you induce this creativity and agency and then you take it away and replace it by, oh, and by the way, here's your strategy because mm -hmm. we have analyzed all the data. Yes. And to see this kind of house of cards just collapse from my perspective. I'm sure there are different perspectives if you ask different people <laughs> about what has happened. So I, I left I left that job mm -hmm. and moved to Amsterdam to redesign my life. Wanted to work in in HR, wanted to work in organizational development to really see, okay, I know that companies have this potential if they just give voice to their people. Mm -hmm. And I thought, okay, I want to do that. But as a former academic, I was unemployable. I very quickly realized that nobody from HR would ever hire me. <laughs> and so searching myself, I started throwing idea parties. I I went to a desk in a, in a, how do you call that? In a, like a co-working space. Co-working space. Thank you. I had a desk in a co-working space and thought, okay, put something on Meetup. Come with your problem. We brainstorm on your solution. So I bought sticky notes and Sharpies and a little bit of beer. And then people would come with their problem and brainstorm on solution. I had my little process on how to brainstorm questions instead of solutions because nobody wants to hear about a solution of a problem that nobody understands in the first place. And then they got so inspired by all the questions that they received and were mind blown and 
And people then start asking me for advice on how to design workshops. And then I got my first gig that someone paid me a thousand dollars to design a workshop that he didn't even want me to deliver. Mm. I was like, wait a moment. There seems to be money in that. <laughs> wait, you just you? had to design the workshop. You didn't have to lead it. Exactly. Ooh. Mm. And, cool. and by then, I, I still didn't know the word facilitation. It was then I came across Priya Parker's book, The Art of Gathering, where she used the word facilitator. And then I took a sticky note in a Sharpie and wrote down, I am a facilitator. <laughs> and just put it everywhere in my room and was so proud. And then I started pitching myself as a facilitator and nobody understood what I meant. Like, oh, you mean a consultant, a coach, a mentor, yeah. an advisor. I'm like, no, a facilitator, I facilitate workshops. Oh, yeah. People still do that. And this was then the gateway into the work, uh, into the podcast. That's why I started the podcast because I like the world needs to know about facilitation. The world needs to know about workshops. Yeah. And did you did you then also discover because I, I this story kind of is similar to my story on not so much facilitation, but more on design thinking. Sort of that mm. I also had all of a sudden it had language. So I, because right, mm. so you need language. So you yeah. can talk about it. So all of a sudden there's like, oh, there's a, there's a word. So you can talk about it and then it exists. And if you don't have the word, it doesn't exist and it's not a thing, right? But it's also, it all, what, what it also did was that all of a sudden I found other people who were yes. also using that word. You're like, oh, and there's other people. We are a tribe. Yeah. I'm not the only crazy one. Yes. Exactly, yeah. Yeah, yeah. But because, because there are lots of moderators. Right? Yes, and I, and I I always have to explain, like you know, because I sometimes I got asked to be sort of a facilitator, but then they expect me to be a moderator, and I, and I'm a, and I'm an awful moderator. I'm really good. I think I'm okay as a facilitator, but as a moderator, I'm terrible because <laughs> that's there's because first of all I have dyslexia, and that and then they expect to be you know they sit in a you know whatever in a circle or a semicircle, and then you you have the the marker and the whiteboard, and you go like John, what do you think? <laughs> You know, okay, Janet, what's your opinion about this? You know, I see you look a bit happy or something, you know, and then you write down what they say. And I can't because I have dyslexia. So if I get a mark, so this made me a really good facilitator because the first thing I do is like, I'm not writing. <laughs> Over the pen. Yes, Here's you're the writing. marker. Here's the marker. <laughs> it's your job. Yeah, because and because I got really used to it because I have dyslexia. I it, Writing down stuff in public, I am really insecure because I will misspell Mm -hmm. you know everything and then i and i have to google it first <laughs> and now use chat gpt like how do you spell this All right and, but, yeah. and so the moderator and the facilitator that's a sometimes a bit of a mix up i mm -hmm. think so yeah. how do you sort of how do you now feel first of all i mean the, there's a community that helps i guess right yeah and how do you position yourself as, as facilitator i mean you podcast yes but what what happened? Did you because you you started with nobody wants first of all, nobody wants an academia and then nobody wants a facilitator. So. Yeah, and then I was talking to a void, and yeah. I thought when I started yeah. the podcast, I thought I will be done after twenty five episodes because how much how much could you talk about facilitation and workshops? Right, good, good question. <laughs> and this is two hundred and sixty eight weeks yeah. ago, so I have I have recorded. By now, 268 podcasts. Wow. All with facilitators around workshops and facilitation and leadership, but always in the context of facilitation. And so I think this was my leverage. So I then unconsciously build a community with an informal community with my podcast guests. Mm -hmm. So I always stayed in touch, reached out tried to bring them together. And when the pandemic hit, I invited them to help me to organize a festival. And because on the podcast, they always told me about their amazingly creative ideas yeah. for workshops that no client would ever pay them for. So I said, okay, so it's the pandemic. We all lost all of our clients anyway. So what if we come together for a festival, you host workshops, and the only condition is that you have to do something that you have never done before. Oh. And that's how, that was basically the moment of birth of what's now a community that's still called Never Done Before, 
where right. we do yeah. stuff, where we just experiment with facilitation methods and ideas. Less less so now than back in the days. So now it's more peer support and still quite and, experimental. Yeah. And this is this is incredible because some of the research that I've been doing is looking at how people learn this. Mm. And there's not a textbook. There's not a college course or say, oh, I went my ma- my majors in a f- facilitation. It doesn't happen. It's a bit like Arna. It's a bit like you. It's a bit, okay, I just kind of stumbled into it and realized I was facilitating. Are you finding like common themes with the with your mm. community? Like that they, how did they totally. come into it? Yeah, I think, every, so I think I met one person who graduated from high school knowing that she wants to be a facilitator. Wow. And her mom has been a facilitator. So that's cheating. That's cheating. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> that doesn't count. Uh, you're disqualified. <laughs> My mom is a facilitator. I don't like you. <laughs> so, so without cheating cases, I don't think that anyone graduates from high school thinking they want to be a facilitator. And so we all have our history. And that's why it's so beautiful, because we all bring our own ideas, ways of doing and history and previous employments to it and professions. What I find is that most facilitators learn it by just starting it. And then they find out, oh, it's a thing. And then they start to to learn more, to read more, to to then eventually start a course or a certification mm-hmm. and read more and more books. But usually we first start and then we realize, oh, <laughs> something yeah um, that by the way you know that because i you know I, I run courses on facilitation and those are the ones i really like the most i really enjoy teaching facilitation mm. I, I, it, it has some because it's so much about psychology and it's it has so much to do mm-hmm. with your own insecurities and your own personality and it's not a, it's not a trick it has to do with you and uh, mm-hmm. and so mm-hmm. I really enjoy getting people sort of in the in that safe space where they can just explore and try stuff out and also be challenged, really challenged, but not challenged in the sense of like, oh, you don't know how to tick the box. No, it's challenged in how you respond to certain situations. So and who are I mean, you as a person, and how exactly. do you show up, and what's your yeah? How do you yeah. deal with your shit because you have to leave it behind so that you don't get triggered by the personalities that will show up, yeah. and. Yeah this participant on the other side of the screen or the other side of the circle is not your mom although you feel like yeah. a little child and want to scream at them not and- your mom who's also a facilitator because <laughs> <laughs> that'd be really horrible like oh mom no <laughs> like the night- the so, nightmare. Yeah, don't, don't get me wrong Anna. i i agree and i also love to teach facilitation and i think we can become better facilitators uh, through training and i think training is not enough no, and i think that not. if we start with training i i actually hardly believe that anyone starts with the training because it's not oh no 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 exactly the people who we teach are people who have experience who exactly and they're of, aware they that they're into it. Feel... yeah exactly and they go like yeah. ha oh, you know i'm so i was so nervous and i i you know how to so they need tips and tricks little things but also but mainly basically is hearing from others going like oh yeah <laughs> you know oh i made those mistakes too you like, oh did you <laughs> like ah okay and you know things like that and saying like oh but you have to kind of you know in your preparation do this or you know little things that really yeah. builds confidence because yes. it's basically confidence being yourself yeah yeah. And that's why I like it so much because it's the psychology behind it. It's not, and then you just have to go and do it because there's no one who can teach you to be a facilitator, yes. but they can ref- help you reflect on yourself and going like, why do I respond to a situation like this? Or mm-hmm. how do I, why am I so nervous about this? Or, hey, there are other people and they are just as nervous as I am of, oh, mm-hmm. if I share what I feel. Actually, that's I, I. I actually I have a little antenna, and I I I feel the energy in the room, and then everybody feels it. But I have to say it out loud, and then things change, et cetera, et cetera. But mm. it's confidence and to model it. Yeah. yeah, it's confidence, and it's just go go and do it. But and training it, helps give you a little bit of a nudge 
So you have a little bit of a toolkit and a little bit of more confidence to go out and then come back and say, hey, what happened? Because we all need that. As, as a facilitator, what I really enjoyed was when I was into, you know, I left uh, Design Thinkers Academy. And so I, I, I kind of restarted my my uh, my uh, my life as a as first as a freelancer and kind of doing a lot of stuff alone. Now I'm kind of building a team again. But having no team, I thought that that was really, I didn't really like that. I like to have a team because I want to come back to the sort of my company, my, my people, my my colleagues, and you know, and go like, oh, I failed, they they hated me, and when you know, and then having people, oh, what happened, and okay, oh, I have to say, come, we have some coffee, yeah, you know, have some, you know, and that <laughs> feeling of being supported in a network yeah. of of others, and so I think we also need that kind of knowing, like, yes. okay, I go out there, I take a chance, mm -hmm. I'm up there, I yeah. be, here I am being vulnerable. And, but I have a yeah. support network. And so your community, for instance, is also that idea of we can talk about that. Yeah. Totally. And I so what resonates with me is, yes, we do need more than just the training and just the doing. I think we also need observing what good facilitation looks like. Mm. What I recently we discovered is also observing what bad facilitation looks like, because sometimes we forget. And we can learn a lot from experiencing bad facilitation. Like, oh, yeah, good reminder. <laughs> and, and community, yes. And then I, it's interesting because I'm, on the one hand, I'm building a community and my core business is actually an agency. So I work with community members <laughs> delivering training for multinational clients who need standard workshops delivered in different, all over the world in different languages, different time zones. So that's the niche where I'm operating in because I do have this. And coming back to the team, I was recently asked, have you considered building a team? It would be so much easier to run such an agency with a, with a fixed team instead of with a community and mixing lots of dynamics. Mm. Uh, talking about human dynamics and psychology, right? There's a lot of mm. stuff coming together. And then I realized that the beauty of community and working with not standard teams in the context that I operate in is that everyone comes in and delivers with their heart. It's not a standardized yes. packaged product. If you hire one of the big consultant, big five consulting companies, yeah, they deliver the training workshop, but it's okay, finish the psychological safety, now doing this, then doing that. And they're like, but someone who is a facilitator by heart with their full heart and is not doing this as part of a job, they will do it in a different way. And you can feel the care they come in with. And now we are full circle back to this additional 5% that make all the difference. So that's then also the beauty. I realized that, okay, I was, I'm lucky and fortunate enough that I don't have to have a team to have the same feeling of support, crying and celebrating together and having this in a community. Yeah. And it's, and I'm thinking of facilitation because it's usually kind of a lonely gig, right? Like it's maybe you, if you're lucky, one, one other and a whole group of people. And it's just the two of you. If you're lucky, right? Yeah. But then if a lot of there's a lot of freelancing facilitators out there. And so I think, but what you're saying, you know, they deliver with the heart. It's not just, okay, you have to facilitate Monday through Friday, every day of the week. And it's I think there's a lot of beauty in that as well. So yeah. It's design to me. It's 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 almost a craft, but it's it's the design of the facilitator is bringing people together and designing the the space and the artifacts and everything so people mm -hmm. feel a certain way and so and, and and so you can guide them in a certain way and and so you it's a it's an it's a it's a it's a form of design that you but it's this it's it's in people and so i do think that the, and, and so we talk about facilitators sort of sort of outsiders who come in I also work with a lot of people who are facilitators within a company. So the topic mm. is sometimes they're the manager and they want to be facilitators too, which is difficult because then they, they also kind of own the, you know, there's always this struggle. We like, and I say, maybe you should have someone from another department facilitate you and stuff like that. But anyway, but my point is that 
the, the sort of the sort of the craft of, of, of bringing people together, and that's also part of the facilitator, a facilitative leader, the facilitator as a leader or the leader as facilitator, that mm -hmm. you design bringing the people together, so building community, uh, knowing like, I need that person and I need that person, I need that person. And if I put them together, something will happen. Because mm -hmm. that's basically what you do as a facilitator. You bring people together and then energy mm -hmm. will you know, emerge, content mm -hmm. will emerge, solutions will, whatever. Yeah. You know, something will emerge because you brought these people together. And mm -hmm. often it's by, you know, you don't really have a, a lot of say in that. Uh, especially if an outsider, they say, well, we have a team that need to be facilitators. And these are just the people you have. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, but if you're inside a business and you're a facilitator, you have sort of an opportunity to say, well, actually, we need someone from HR. We need someone from 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 uh, IT. We need someone from design. And I'm going to put those people together. And I think, so I really love mm -hmm. that kind of opportunity with that, in, you know, if you're an the facilitator who's internal, who has that, you know, at least has the skill as well, but also the leadership quality and 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 confidence, if you will, to say, well, actually, I'm gonna I'm gonna pull in all these people, and because I need to have a diverse group of people, and I mm -hmm. I'm really conscious about designing that. But as your community, for instance, to me, that's a similar thing. It's like you bring people together, you know, you you facilitate the sort of the you know bringing people together. And and then stuff will happen. Not always yeah. what you want it, because but you will observe it. Exactly. And like right, so you're like, oh, sometimes it's 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 good, sometimes it's bad, but it's always interesting, and it's always like, oh, I didn't know that was going to happen. I think that is the future of organization. Mm -hmm. I think what you what build is sort of, and you know, it's going to take a long time for. It's not going to replace all business, but I think a a let me put. It, in, in another way, a really important future of organization, it's what we've been seeing anyway uh, the last two, three decades, is network organizations, mm. community organizations, you know, in a connected company, whatever name or label people put on it. But that's what you're doing. You're saying, hey, we have all these people out there. They're all these great people. I'm going to facilitate that. And bring, I'm not their boss. So I can't tell them to, you know, to do exactly what I what I want. So I need to kind of manage them, lead them differently. And mm. and I think that is the future of, of business. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Very yeah. interesting perspective. Also because I think facilitators, a facilitators are good community builders because they know that it's not about them, but about the community members. Mm -hmm. That's the community strong. And... Yeah, indeed, the moment that the community members are aware of this, of the value that lies in the community and not the leader and what the leader provides. Because I think many join communities are because they want to follow this one thought leader or they want to learn from this person. But I think if you really step into the power of a community and see all the value through the connections and the trust that is inherently there because you are part of the same community then the power shifts also where the member is empowered and enabled to really tap into this value by building connections, collaborating with other community members, and then doing their own thing. Yeah, I think that's beautiful. And very few, I think, see that yet. And I'm intrigued by the example you're giving with a yeah. network economy and networked organization. And I'm thinking back to like the idea of creative leadership, right? And I think facilitators are like the unsung ultimate creative leaders mm. because they can, like you said, they're taking action, they're they're coming together in community and they're able to see things in a different way without necessarily being prompted. And it's a tough, you know, how do we inspire? And would I want to live in a, I think I would love to live in a neighborhood full of facilitators. I think that would be. Be careful. What do you wish for? <laughs> <laughs> I, I think you do, by the way. <laughs> virtual. Space the virtual. That's true. I was just looking out my neighbor, out my window at my neighborhood and the. I was like. Well, oh, yeah, but, but this is a really good point. I think, I think you'll discover that in your neighborhood there there are many facilitators 
people who organize mm-hmm. stuff for 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 the mm-hmm. neighborhood for the you know for for the street for who arrange things you don't who are not asked to do so because that to me that's a leadership right so you're not asked to do it you do it because you see something you're like hey i'm going to fix that i'm going to do that and leaders at least creative or facilitative leaders are people who will do something that sh- kind of shows to others like that there's another op- or other possibility another option mm-hmm. uh, you know they show options that you didn't even consider uh, like yeah. in behavior or in whatever you know You're like oh i i you can do that's a facilitator too right because a facilitator makes you feel a little bit uncomfortable because it stretches sort of the possibilities of how you behave you can behave this way whoa you know so that's what mm-hmm. creates it, it's actually mm-hmm. the looking for sort of stretching the you know the the, the boundaries which it makes it easier for you to behave differently and so I think if you look in the street and, and you get to know, I mean, you know, if I think about sort of the people who live in my neighborhood, I I know a lot of people who I would call facilitators in a certain way because they kind of organize stuff, bring yeah. people together, you know, and and they would never consider that as facilitation. But I think yeah. there's there there's organizers, and there's people who organize stuff, and there's people who show up. Mm. I, mm-hmm. That's how I divide the world, basically. And there are those who <laughs> who facilitate stuff because I think there's also a difference because the you can you can organize, for instance, a neighborhood party. Mm-hmm. So you have the shared space and you put everything out there and you distribute the invitation. Then people arrive and everyone who's all the same buildings stay in their little cliques and talk to each other or all the partners talk to each other. And at the end of the day, everyone ate their own food and (laughs) talked to the same people and leaves. The organizer did their job. A facilitator creates a space that makes it easy for people from the different buildings talk to each other and families break up and talk to each other and people to share the food and not only to eat the food that they brought. Yeah. That's a facilitative skill. And yeah. I think you can do this by saying, hey, let's play a little game. Da, da, da. Or yeah, exactly. you can do it by the way you arrange the food yep. or yep. where you share a little prompt at the beginning that makes it just a little, that gives permission to share yeah, something. Exactly. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I did a, uh, a word, uh, and hence connect people with each other. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Now I, I wanted to say that this made me think of um, something that to me was was really simple, but it had such a big effect is that we ran a conference and actually this year it's going to be run again, the, the design thinking conference. And uh, I thought, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to create buddies. And uh, oh, yes. so I'm just going to give, you know, I'm just going to point people to each other as you connect people to get to each other. You know? And so people you didn't know. So you had to look. So you got basically the name of your buddy and you had to go look for that person because you're going to do some exercises with that person. And, and, and th- that changed so much because people came into the conference with a colleague or a friend or what mm-hmm. have you, and they had to go and look for someone else. And so you brought awesome. them up. And they yeah. started talking to each other. Are you this? Because I'm looking for someone because we had a sort of a description. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, uh, yeah. So, cool. and that, yes, yeah, it's, it's such a simple thing. And and although it made it a bit awkward for people in the beginning, mm-hmm. but they loved it because it, it they knew, everybody knows, like, I have the same, like, I, you know, I'm I'm socially awkward. Not, I'm not socially I think most facilitators are. Uh, yeah, that, that tracks. That's, yeah. that's that why tracks. that's why we we are good at it because we're that's something that I have realized that most of us come from families where as children we already had to facilitate. Ah. And many of us are a little bit socially awkward, so that yeah. we know exactly what where friction comes in and how to make it easier. Yeah, my wife always oh, says, "Arna, you're work with you are working with people all day, and then at home when the doorbell rings, you don't want to open the door." And I guess you're like, oh, I don't want to see people. Exactly. You're like, what's going on? Is that? I said, it's different. I don't know. I don't know. It's as a facilitator. <laughs> it's but it, you you're saying, oh, that's interesting. I never thought about that. So you're saying that we're solving our own problems, are... basically. <laughs> <laughs> and I, can I just reflect back why your the way you're 
facilitating the body system is so brilliant, I think, because you could have done it easy that you say, okay, here's a meeting point, hold your badge or hold the name up and find your body. This would have been easy and less awkward. And less of the fact that you made it a little bit of a scavenger hunt, you gave them some nuggets and breadcrumbs, yeah. and then you created friction. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's really cool. Yeah. To yeah, actually yeah, yeah. create the space yeah. that facilitated this right. connection building, yeah. because then you not only find your body, but you have to talk to all these other people. Yeah. So yeah. a brilliant system to a facilitation that facilitation is not always creating the easiest way to get to a solution. Mm, yeah, yeah, but yeah. The and most it's created this other thing. So way. our common friend Adam, yeah, I actually know you through Adam because we had dinner in Amsterdam. I can't remember why. He'll be, yeah, he'll be on yeah. the podcast. Yeah, he, uh, yeah, and he, so he was sort of our, our sort of MC kind of a guy at the conference at the time, and so we not everyone managed within the time they had to find their buddies. But there was like, you know, we were looking for, they were looking for people. And so he also got the opportunity to go like, okay, who found their body? You know, and so there was a bit of chaos. Like, okay, who's looking for, who are you looking for? Like, Janet, Janet, is there Janet here? Okay, you go. So he can, he, he used that again <laughs> to create this really interesting game of, of, you know, people waving their, their little note of like, I'm looking for this person. <laughs> yeah, creating so, a sense of belonging, of yeah, safety. Yeah. Everyone is taken care of. You're yeah, not exactly. alone. Yeah. I never, yeah. I didn't think so that was going to happen. Yeah. So it's in October. <laughs> so I'm not part of it anymore because I left the company, but it's in October. It's October. When you say that uh, correctly, you know, 10, 11, the, the Friday and the the Thursday and the Friday of that week. I think it's the ninth or no, the tenth and the eleventh or something like that. Yeah, tenth of October. Note to self. October. Designthinkingconference.com, which was my baby, and I love it. And but I I left the company. <laughs> but my good friend Jeroen uh, is running it. Uh, so go go go. Yes. <laughs> An interesting think, story right was, there. And that was one of the things that I told because you know you're bringing up. It's not always the easiest way. Um, and that's what I would tell my students, like everything I do is intentional. And, you know, and as a facilitator, you really have to think about all of these really minor things, really minor things, because it makes an impact. And so, you know, so I was saying like everything I do when I'm facilitating you guys is intentional. And it's really, it starts to, I see their little brain start working and it's really fun. Yeah. yeah. Oh, it's on purpose? <laughs> yeah, back to the love letter, right? Yeah, the, exactly. the minor yeah. things that make the difference. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah, that's fascinating. You can actually use ChatGPT to design a workshop, which is, and at one point I experimented with this and I and I had it create these sort of warm-ups, uh, you know, these games. And I and I had, I, I think I created like a, a hundred because I was like, give me 10 more. Because <laughs> I love it, which mm -hmm. makes me feel guilty, by the way, because I, I do say sorry to chat GPT. And I'm sorry, can you give me 10 more? <laughs> like, okay. Can you please um, give me 10 more? Okay, please, sorry. <laughs> you know, <laughs> but you know, they're like, yes, certainly. Wonderful. I will. You know, anyway, 10 more, 10 more. And it created these games that were amazing, by the way, because I just keep kept going and like, oh, this is really interesting. Do that again. Do that more. So it's it's such a great serendipity machine as well. So you can actually have ChatGPT help you with your your workshop because it can create all these options you never thought about. But again, critical thinking. Hey, you know, as facilitators, <laughs> because we I are find this fascinating that before ChatGPT came, we always thought that. AI will replace us in everything, but creativity, that's inherently human. Create, only we can be creative. And what it actually showed in your example underlines it, that mm. AI is way more creative than we are. When we, when we define creativity as linking old ideas in a new way so that a new mm -hmm. idea emerges. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but the point is that but, you're but right, you're right. But my, my brain then goes like, huh, that's interesting. So my computer, my little brain computer still needs to pick up on it. Exactly. And, and this is where I want to go. So AI might be more creative than we are, but distinguishing the relevant from the irrelevant, assessing whether it actually makes sense, mm -hmm. all this, these creative boosts that it came up, this AI cannot do. And I find it so ironic that we totally mispredicted. We're like, oh, creativity, that's for humans. 
no, creativity is great for AI, but we need yeah. our critical thinking and the sense making. Yeah. yeah and I, I I think we misunderstand creativity, to be honest. I think creativity mm -hmm. is not coming up with lots of ideas. Creativity is actually our our the I think the core of our our creativity is that we are problem solvers. Mm -hmm. so, but we are also stupid. So we break <laughs> things. I, yeah, the, you know, the, I think the core of our creativity is that we're that we're dumb. We break things. We drop stuff. We kind mm -hmm. of we go like, oops. And then, it creates something new where we where we're gonna have so many innovations breakthrough innovation the biggest breakthrough innovations either came from accidents that we you know a lot of especially in the medical world so many things happened uh, you know mm. that changed our mm -hmm. lives just by, because some scientist made a mistake didn't wash mm. his hands or something like that or it's from war you know, that we need to kill as many people as fast as possible. So we're going to be like, ah, oh, we're going to create this amazing weapon and this stuff happens. And so because of you're so stupid, you know, we are inventive and we, that, that I think part of our creativity and I think chat GPT or, or, you know, whatever AI you're using can also be stupid or make mistakes. Let me put it that way. Mm -hmm. But it, but it's different. You still have to recognize that your, that your creativity is like, I see a point in this. Oh, yeah. I can use that. Exactly. Exactly. You know? yeah. I'm like, oh, that is awesome. Like, yeah. Serendipity. Yeah. That's that's yeah. what we are. We are, we see patterns. We recognize a pattern where we go like, huh, that that means something to me, which you know, to chat GPT didn't mean anything because there is no meaning. Exactly. We have to point, we have to find the gems, definitely. And I would not, I, I agree that creativity is not coming up with many ideas. But creativity is linking old things in a new way so that something new emerges. And then yeah. finding that this is a gem, yes. that's where the value is. Machine. Because, because I machine. think, yes, we break the way, things. And at the same time, we often don't dare to combine things in a new way or to to deviate from how we've ever done it. Or yeah. Yeah. So that's, the, that's, that's what we uh, still have to be doing. Because we yeah. still have to take that from the machine and say, yes. "I'm going to do it." And then, the, the, and then again. So I, I created all these games, which is really cool. I had two of them, and then I tried it on a group, and then it, two failed. One was really cool, but it didn't happen exactly the way I thought it was going to happen because it did something else. But the point is that it's such a great tool. But we've had. Inspiration. Like that. I mean, yeah, we had, mm -hmm. I mean, I Googled stuff before. I mean, you know, that was also a serendipity machine. You know, you know, we, we had, you know, we've, we've had so AI has been everywhere. Anyway, technology has been helping us do new things in a different way for centuries. Right. So it is nothing mm -hmm. new. It's just that it's, uh, it creates a moment of chaos. And I love sort of this whole idea of chaos and order. So in chaos, you become more creative, like your story, of being sort of, you know, because of the lockdowns, because of uh, COVID, you started doing things differently because you have to reinvent stuff. And and because, you know, you were all stuck and there was no, no clients, so you do other things. And so that creates opportunities for us people where we're like, huh, but out of necessity and out of, out of need. And so we're problem solvers and we take whatever we have. It doesn't matter what it's called. I mean, if, you know, we, we, we use whatever. <laughs> We're like, oh, you use, use this. And it's fine. It's all good. And, and, and I don't know, I, I kind of like that chaotic bit of it very much. And I think that's also part of facilitation, that you're okay with the chaos. That mm -hmm. if you're not okay with chaos, you're going to be so nervous as a facilitator because chaos is going to happen. But that's what you need to create. And then you need to steer it to order. And then you go like, oh, Okay, enough with the chaos. And now we have to kind of, I have this other thing and you're going to focus, you know, and we, we're going to kind of, and I had this model and I designed it in such a way that it's on the wall and there's a tool and there's a game or there's a exercise or there's a double diamond or whatever you know, we mm -hmm. created with nice words and lines and whatever graphics. And then we start focusing and we become, you know, more focused. So I think, I believe that facilitators and facilitative leaders, I think that's the future of leadership. There, so just want to. It's the only thing I wanted to say. <laughs> <laughs> so you're not facilitating. What else is there to say? Yeah, you're not going to be a leader. That's basically what I'm saying. You have to, to all the leaders out there. Yeah. 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 
right? waiting for the moment that facilitation becomes a subject in in the management courses and the MBAs and yeah, different tangent, different. Podcasts. It's happening. It's happening. Yeah. yeah. I think it's yeah. happening. Everyone who teaches design thinking and service design and agile, you know, it all takes a different management style. It takes a different leadership style. You can't get, you cannot have an agile company, real agile company, without leaders who are facilitators. So, I mean, we don't have any real agile companies except for yours. Your community is a real agile company. That's, I totally believe that that is the future of companies that's because a company is a community of people mm -hmm. but the, the 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 system kind of restricts it in a certain way and it has, so it becomes a creates a culture of fear out of it because you don't really trust that system not really really you know but you your community that's a real agile company that's how companies should be that's an ecosystem mm -hmm. and that is also not about eternal growth because that's not what a community is, right? It is about balance. Mm -hmm. You need to mm -hmm. kind of, you have a yep. balance act all the time. And that is the skill of, of a real creative leader, being yep. sort of being able to balance that and keep that community and that ecosystem alive. And, you know, and, and, and it's, so I think, yeah. So yay to you. Yay. <laughs> 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 hmm. Wow. Okay, so we've talked for a long time and, and we still didn't really get to know you. This is not the conversation <laughs> I wanted to have, but I think because that all three of us are so interested in this topic. Yeah, yeah. Kind of, it know. was a wonderful conversation. Yeah. <laughs> it's, and we talked about leadership. We, we talked did. about creative leadership. Yeah. So yeah. I hope it's good enough for your podcast. It is, but I, I, one good. question I still want to ask, why Amsterdam? Oh, I wanted to all the places of... in the world. Yeah, 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 I know. I mean, it's another place, but there's so many London because of Amsterdam. So there was a short list of three cities. Amsterdam was first, second was Copenhagen, and third mm -hmm. was Berlin. Mm -hmm. Funny enough, all cities with bad weather, as I now realize. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, but it was fun. I was somehow attracted by Amsterdam, and what I love about Amsterdam—that's why I stayed. It's welcoming. It's a very facilitative city. Huh. Mm. I've never thought that thought before. But oh. I think it's it doesn't judge. It accepts everyone as they are. It's very easy, especially for freelancers. And then I couldn't believe how easy it was to, to first become a freelancer and then to switch the freelance ship into a limited company. Suddenly I had a limited company. I'm like, <gasps> but nobody... Nobody tested anything. <laughs> I'm just Nobody allowed to do verified. this. <laughs> now I am responsible. Yeah. yeah. It's a great okay. place. Yeah, good to know. It's my favorite city. So good. Good to hear. Good to hear. <laughs> I didn't know it was very, very welcoming because typically I know. I So I come from a long line of people from Amsterdam. And people from Amsterdam, they're the original people. We're not the most friendly people. They're not the most friendly people. <laughs> they're funny they have a nice sense of humor but very harsh which i kind yeah, of like but, so but uh, it's not as if they're the most friendly but then if you have i lived in in paris and i lived in luxembourg and i lived in vietnam and i'm from germany amsterdam is so welcoming right <laughs> depends yeah. on what you compare it with yeah compared to paris it's yes yeah. Don't know and like, it, like what you said, like it's, it doesn't judge people, you know, it just kind of lets yeah. them be who they are and do their thing. Yeah. And, and there's a lot of, it, well, at least I'm more familiar with the States, you know, there's a lot of cities in the States that would, medium sized cities that would welcome you in and be, oh, I'm super happy, but you're not going to do it exactly how we do it. Uh, okay. That's not as uh, awesome. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. And in Amsterdam you have, it attracts all different kind of people. So I find it fascinating how in a museum like the Rijksmuseum, you have the middle-aged cultural couple coming for a culture weekend and visiting the museum next to a bunch of totally stoned teenagers <laughs> who walked out the coffee shop and walk into the Rijksmuseum. And you have the yuppies and the old people and everyone is kind of 
brought together through culture, although they would never meet in the same space in a different part of the world. Well, I, I need to go to the Rijk Museum again to see that again. It's been a long time. Uh, <laughs> yes. I can recommend <laughs> it. Yes. Oh, cool. Okay. So last question. I still, I, I want to uh, ask this last question because I want to, I want your opinion or your thought or your kind of feeling about the future. Oh, yeah. So, you know, what is, what is next for you? What are you, I mean, this is this sort of, are you going to continue just doing the same thing you're doing now? Or do you have foresee something or do you foresee something for the facilitators of the world or what's mm -hmm. shifting? What's changing? Mm -hmm. One thing I've, one lesson I learned is whatever I plan doesn't work and whatever I end up doing <laughs> happened out of by accident. So I created a community by accident, which then turned into an agency by accident. Now we're experimenting with courses. So how we're community members who are all independent, they all come. So we are method agnostic. So everyone comes not only from a different country, but also from a different school of thought. Mm -hmm. So creating a sp facilitating the space where they can combine forces to collaborate and create a course together to teach externals about facilitation. That's my current curiosity. And I think there's beautiful value in it because we don't, it doesn't exist yet. Mm -hmm. If I want to learn about design thinking or service design, if I want to learn about liberating structures, I know exactly where to go. If I want to learn about facilitation, it doesn't make sense to go to one person who teaches me facilitation because facilitation is not this one thing. Yeah. It is everything. So this is something that we're trying to mimic. And I'm my latest crazy project that reminds me a bit of the early days of Never Done Before is I invited my podcast guests on a project to collectively write a book. And I started with the working title, What We Talk About When We Talk About Facilitation. Mm -hmm. And inspired by Haruki Murakami's What I Talk About When I Talk About Running. And we had the first two gatherings herding cats it was uh, absolute <laughs> chaos mm -hmm. and after the second gathering i realized that the book needs a different title and i'm now landing on a practical guide on how to change the world through facilitation oh cool <laughs> <laughs> that's cool so if um, you want to be part of this so i mean i know there's a the, the website is neverdonebefore.org yeah right so you can check that out yeah i mean if there's a facilitator out there lonely in a corner someone yeah. crying it's a paid community it has quite a high price tag because we see it as an investment and we have a purchasing power adjusted fee so anyone who's joining from a country that has a weaker currency we adjust the price according to the purchasing power of that country yeah, yeah. awesome thank awesome. you awesome i think yeah, that's that sounds really really cool. So, we we have to. I think if anyone managed to get to the end of the of podcast, course. then <laughs> go to neverdonebefore.org. to check that out. If you survive that, you survive everything. <laughs> yeah, and if you want more of that, then you yeah yeah, and you're a big fan, then then you actually you need to be there. So uh, thank you very much for yeah, uh, thank for you this, so much. Uh, this thank you, inspiring. loved it. Such a great conversation. Yeah, I'm sure the audience enjoyed it as much as we did. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we always hope so. <laughs>